Good morning to our worship service this morning at Aletheia Baptist Church. We worship every Sunday. We would like for you, and we thank you for even joining us this morning. And this morning we have something um, that we normally do on first Sundays, which is the communion service, where we welcome you and those of you that are watching by, by internet, we want to invite you to, at home, get you some juice and get you some crackers because we want you to celebrate Communion Sunday with us this morning. So we want to go ahead and allow you some time to get your juice and your crackers so that you can have communion with us because this time we take on every first Sunday to honor the remembrance of what Jesus Christ did for us when he died for us on the cross. And at this time, I'm going to read a passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, and after supper, he said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. Now, brothers and sisters, before we eat this Lord's Supper, the Bible says, examine yourself if you have any sin against a brother or if your relationship is not right with the Lord. We want to give, take a moment just to make sure that everything is right with the Lord and also right with your brothers. Because do not drink this and eat this in an unworthy manner. Because the significance of this, Jesus Christ gave his life for you. And gave his life for me, and we should not take this in a manner that is unworthy, that is unfitting of what he did, and not take it and be willfully sinning against the body of the Lord. So we want to take just a brief moment, a silent reflection. Let's get our relationship right with man and God. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, what we're going to do, this is the body. And this is the blood. Jesus says, often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat and drink together. Let us pray to the Lord. Father God, we thank you. Father, we thank you for allowing us to celebrate this supper. Father, celebrate what you have done. Father, in remembrance of you, because one day, Father, we're going to be with you. And Father, we're going to be eating and drinking with you. Father, this is a time of celebration in light of what's going on in the world. Father, we're not looking for political leaders. Father, we're not looking for, for the government to solve our problems. But, Father, we're looking for you. And, Father, we're looking for your imminent return. So, God, we thank you for allowing us, as we are here, to enjoy your supper. Father, looking forward. Father, looking forward to the day that we can be with you and sit around the table and eat and drink with you. In Jesus' name, God, we thank you and we do praise you. Amen.
check one, two. Okay. <clears throat> I'm ready. All right. Thank you, Reverend Franks, for uh, communion. And we try to do this every first Sunday. So uh, since we have not been gathering together physically as a church, so some of the members want to continue it, so we decided to do it <clears throat> over the Internet. So we thank God for him and his ministry here at the church. This morning I want us to uh, turn to Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, where Jesus states, <clears throat> blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those that mourn and who are meek, and hunger and thirst for righteousness. And so we're going to look at uh, this text this morning, verses uh, 1 through 12 in the book of Matthew, uh, with uh, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> it's interesting to me the structure of the beginning early chapters of Matthew. There's a structure that's going on in this text that I like to kind of bring out that leads me to Matthew chapter 5. In fact, if you would um, uh, write this down somewhere, file it in your mind, the early chapters of Matthew, Jesus is retracing the steps of Israel. That's what he's doing. And, and he's doing this for a reason. And in Matthew uh, chapter 2, uh, we read where, uh, where Herod wants to destroy the Christ child and God tells Joseph to get up, take Mary uh, and the child, take him down to Egypt. And in verse 14, so Joseph did exactly what God said. He rose and took the child, his mother, by night and departed for Egypt. And he was there until Herod died. And notice Matthew quotes from Exodus 4.22 and also Hosea 11.1, 1, where God says that the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, out of Egypt did I call my son. And so Israel goes down to Egypt. Christ goes down to Egypt. Israel's going to come up out of Egypt. And then Christ is going to come up out of Egypt. Now, when Israel comes out of Egypt, the first place that they go to is called the Red Sea. The Red Sea is going to be their deliverance, their physical deliverance, which would picture their uh, uh, spiritual deliverance. So Israel goes to the Red Sea. Christ goes to the Jordan River. Now watch this. God, Jesus tells John to baptize him. And John said, well, I don't need to baptize you. You need to be baptized of me. And Jesus says in verse 15, permit it uh, that it be fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And after being baptized, Jesus immediately went up from the water. Well, so how does that relate to the, uh, the children of Israel? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2 tells us, 
that when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they went to the Red Sea, and the Red Sea was their baptism. Their baptism unto Moses. You see, when you get delivered, saved, God expects you and me to follow him in baptism. Okay? So here they are, they're baptized. Well, after they come up out of the Red Sea, they travel. They're headed to the promised land. They go days without water. And they go days without bread. And they begin to complain to the Lord. <laughs> what are we going to eat? God go, Moses goes to God and God began to uh, rain down cornflakes. It's pretty much what it was. Something similar to a wafer. You know, a rich cracker or something like that. And uh, they didn't want that. They didn't want that. Their God was testing them. So what did Jesus do after he comes out of the water? He goes to the wilderness to be tested by the devil. To break him down pretty much. And notice Jesus quotes these passages in, in uh, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 68 in his uh, statements of the devil. It stands written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so you got Jesus, Israel going to Egypt. You got Jesus going to Egypt. You got Israel coming out of Egypt. You got Jesus coming out of Egypt. You got Jesus leaving Egypt and fast forward now, he, 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 30 years later, uh, he's at the Jordan River with John. Israel goes to the Red Sea with Moses. Both have been baptized. And after the baptism, we see the temptation. Okay? Now, what happens after the temptation? What happens after, uh, uh, what happens uh, uh, in the wilderness with the children of Israel? There's a place they got to stop off. Okay? There's a significant place that the children of Israel has to stop off first before they get to the promised land. And this place is called Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, they would spend a year at Sinai. What was God doing at Sinai? Sinai. God was teaching his people the kind of God he was who had delivered them from Egypt. So what does Jesus do? As Israel goes to Egypt, Jesus goes to Egypt. As Israel comes out of Egypt, Jesus comes out of Egypt. As Israel gets baptized in the Red Sea, Jesus gets baptized in the Jordan River. As Israel's Get tested by the Lord, said they're going to obey his word. Jesus got tested by the Lord. And as Israel goes to Mount Sinai as a redeemed people, they got to learn what this God like and how they are to live in light of their redemption. But what does Jesus do when he leaves the wilderness? He goes to the mountain. <laughs> We call it the Sermon on the Mount. What is he going to do? He is going to teach his people how redeemed people ought to live in light of his coming again. Okay? He hasn't come yet. So now he's instructing his people. These are the type of people that I expect you to be as redeemed people. And so he enters Bless it. Okay? Now, many people think just having material things and money is a sign of blessing. And that could be an indication in many cases. Because see, in the first century when Jesus was living, they had a, they had a saying, uh, the Jews had a saying, if you want to be uh, uh, rich, go, uh, uh, rich, go to Galilee because it's a fishing town. But if you want to be spiritual, Go to Jerusalem. Okay? And that if you're wealthy, 
is because God is making you rich. And so people look at people who got lots of money, and they watch how people live and can buy $10 million homes and, and drive Maseratis, uh, 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 buy Maseratis for their kids, and they conclude God has really blessed them. They determine God's blessings in terms of monetary and material gains. But your history is full of wealthy people who died unhappy and miserable. Let me give you a few examples. America's first millionaire, multimillionaire, and the richest man in the world at that time said, I am the most miserable man on earth. The richest man at one time. John D. Rockefeller, the founder of Standard Oil Company, said, I have made millions, but it brought me no happiness whatsoever. Henry Ford said, I was happier when I was doing a mechanic's job. So just having money, just having wealth, does not mean a person is experiencing a blessed life. And Jesus wants to tell you what a truly blessed person looks like. You see, what determines when you say, I'm blessed and highly favored? You know, we got that cliche going on. and You know, how you doing this morning? Oh, I'm, high, I'm blessed and highly favored. Okay, then tell me how. How do you determine whether or not you've been blessed and highly favored? Well, the answer is found in Matthew chapter 5. Let's take a look at these verses right quick, and then we'll uh, let you go for the day. Hallelujah. Now, in chapter 5, it says, And Jesus saw the multitude, he went up on the mountain, verse 1, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Now watch this now. Want to note this. Good background material. In the first century, when rabbis read the scripture, they stood. When they taught the scriptures, they sat, like I'm sitting now. Okay? Sitting, sitting, implied that the message uh, that the instructor, the professor, the rabbi is teaching is authoritative. You can bank on it. So Jesus gets on the mountain and guess what he does? He sits. Okay, You remember the phrase where it says, Paul said, I was sitting at the feet of Gamaliel? Why? Because Gamaliel would sit on a raised platform, and the students would sit on the floor with their legs crossed on a, on a pillow. And the, and, 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 and the teacher would begin to teach them, and that's called sitting at their feet. Okay? So it's not by accident that Jesus is sitting. Now when you see him in, 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 in the temple in chapter 4 of Luke, he's standing. He's reading Isaiah. Here he's sitting because he's going to speak to a redeemed people about what a truly blessed person is like. So he says, notice, verses 5, chapter 5. He opened his mouth and said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You see, brothers and sisters, the word blessed is used about 50 times in the New Testament. 13 times in Matthew. It's used eight times right here in this passage. The word there is, is makarios. The other words uh, in, in Hebrew for blessed, uh, ashri, is one word that's used for blessing. Uh, that's found uh, in Psalms 1, blessed is the man. Okay? That's called Ashri. And this Ashri is a counterpart to the New Testament word blessed here, makarios. There's another word for blessed in the Hebrew Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, called Baruch, uh, Barak. We got 
President Barack Obama, his name in Hebrew means to bless. I'll be blessed. All right? Now, Baruch is only used of God. So it has the idea of all praises be to God. Okay? And the reason why Baruch, or Barak, is a uh, uh, use of God is because you and I can't give God nothing to enrich his life. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Only thing we can give God is what? Praise. Makarios is the kind of blessing where you are receiving something from God. Okay? Blessing has the idea of uh, to be right with God. Okay? Uh, it means to be fortunate. It means to be satisfied with life. It's a person who is rightly related to God. Notice when he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. What is the poor in spirit? Two words in Greek for poor. One is penes, P-N-E-S. That means this person uh, has one sandwich, and that's all they got. <laughs> all right. Here's a person, he got, in his lunch, but he got, only got one sandwich. Let, let, let's break it on down. Only one cookie. <laughs> and you ask for something, his cookie, man, that's all I got. <laughs> But that's the word penes. Okay? Another word is tokoi. P T O C H O I. Tokoi. P is silent. This word means this man ain't got a cookie at all. He ain't got a sandwich in the box. He poor. He ain't just poor. He is poor. He ain't got nothing. This word symbolizes abject poverty. This is the word that Jesus used. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say the poor in the bank. Okay? Because you can be rich in the bank and still be poor in spirit. So what does Jesus mean? How blessed, how fully satisfied are those who are poor in spirit. The poor in spirit are those who see their spiritual condition and they realize they, can't, they ain't got nothing to bring to God but their heart. They can't offer God nothing for his salvation. They can't offer God nothing for his righteousness. They're totally spiritually bankrupt. And they see their great need for God. And the poor spirit of those. Yeah Lord I got a lot of money at the bank. But my life is a stone wreck. And I need Jesus in my life. Those are the poor in spirit. Oh how blessed are those. Who see their true spiritual condition. And not trying to bring God anything because they ain't got nothing they can bring to God. Because brothers and sisters, God won't accept anything from you and me. Other than confessing our sins before him. And inviting him. And trusting him as our personal savior. That's all God wants from you. That's all he wants. If you're not a believer, that's all God wants from you and me. It's nothing. I had a friend in seminary. This made me think of him this week. And I've been out of seminary now 34 years. But I remember very distinctly uh, that uh, I was up in my room in the dormitory uh, translating the first chapter of Jonah for class on, on the book of Jonah for a Hebrew class. And this guy came to my room. He said, hey, Reed, what you doing? I said, well, I'm finishing up uh, uh, this uh, uh, assignment for in the morning. He said, how much you got to go? I said, well, I'm putting the finishing touches on it right now. He said, uh, well, listen, man, when you finish, let's go get something to eat. Well, I ain't have no money. <laughs> so I told him, <laughs> hey, man, you know, you're looking at a poor man here. Hey, I don't have any money to, to go out. And, and buy anything 
don't worry. I said, what you mean? He said, my daddy is wealthy. And I got a credit card with unlimited uh, access to. I said, what? <laughs> you got what now? I got a credit card that has unlimited access. Now I want y'all to know, <laughs> we didn't go to no McDonald's. <laughs> I wasn't going to no McDonald's. <laughs> Not with a fella got unlimited access to a credit card. And so he took me and three other guys and he paid for everything. So I got blessed simply by hanging out with him. I ain't have nothing. Absolutely nothing. And my friends with her, they didn't have nothing either. So just hanging with him, we got blessed. You know, when you hang out with God, God will bless you. In many ways in one. But one day I did have a little money. And he came by. He said, hey, Reed, let's go. I got some of the buddies. I said, okay, man. Got to the restaurant. We ate. Bill came and said, man, I got this. I'm, I'm going to pay. I got a little money now. I got a little money now. My mama sent me some money in the mail. I got some. I can pay for this today. He said, nope. You can't pay. I said, man, you can't just pay all the time. He said, no. I told you. You can't give me any money. I said, dog. Okay. So I didn't have to give him any money. Now this passage reminds me of that story too. Because here's a guy who had unlimited use of a credit card. I had some money. But he wouldn't accept the money that I had. Amen, somebody. God won't accept anything you bring but yourself. That's it. Blessed are the, spirit, uh, the poor in spirit. Theirs is a kingdom of God. God won't accept nothing from you. So the hymn writer says, nothing in my hands I bring. Only to the cross I cling. How blessed are the poor in spirit. And then notice the truly blessed person is also is heartbroken over sin and evil. Blessed are they who mourn for they shall be comforted. Notice they're heartbroken over violence, injustice, and racism, and tyranny, and corruption. They're heartbroken over their own sin and their utter unworthiness. Are you heartbroken about what's going on in America right now? Do we mourn over evil and wickedness, violence, the looting and Burning down our neighborhoods. Do we mourn over that? Do we mourn over the death, the murder of a young man whose life was snuffed out unjustly? Do we mourn? Do we mourn over the lives of those people in the city of Chicago that are dying weekly? Are we mourning about that? Do we mourn over those who are dying here in our city? Black-owned black crime in our city. Do we mourn the deaths of those 29 young people that are dead today? And the year is only six months old. Do we mourn? Do we mourn our own sin? Our own attitude? When we, when we fail God, do we mourn? Do we mourn those who call evil good and good evil? Do we mourn that our culture is embracing people who can self-identify as another gender? Do we mourn? Do the church mourn? When people call evil good and they call good evil. How blessed are those? How fully satisfied God said those who mourn. They mourn. For they shall be comforted by God. God is going to set things right one day, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. And God is going to comfort us even during this time. The 
Do you mourn? Do you feel the pain of those who are suffering and grieving and the loss of life? Do you mourn? A little girl came home from a neighbor's house one day and her friend had died and uh, she went over to the house to comfort her mother. Her father, as she got in the house, asked her, why did you go over there? She said, I want to go and comfort my friend's mother. The father said, what can you do to comfort her? She said, I just climbed up in her lap and cried with her. That's why Paul said we ought to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Do we mourn? God's going to comfort us one day. The truly blessed life has a humble spirit. Notice what he said. Blessed are those who are gentle. For they shall inherit the earth. Those that are meek. Meek does not mean weakness. The word pros, P-R-A-U-S, for meek is a word is used of a horse or a stallion who has been unbroken. He's wild. You see it on the cowboy movies. Fella gets on the horse, and the horse just bucking, trying to throw him off. The rodeo bucking him, trying to throw him off. And he just stays on him. He stays on him. He stays on him. And all of a sudden, the horse calms down. He's broken the horse. The horse still got the same strength that he had before he stopped. He just got it under control. That's what a meek person is. Is strength under control. They're humble. They have the strength to retaliate. They don't retaliate. They got the strength to restrain the anger in the midst of adversity. Notice something else about the meek and the humble. They got a teachable spirit. See, one of the problems today in the church, we don't have enough folk that's teachable. Do you have a teachable spirit? Are you humble? Are you meek? It's not that you're weak. It takes a lot of strength. It takes power of God to help you to be under control when somebody's at you. <laughs> Amen, somebody. That's strength under control, ladies and gentlemen. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You see, ladies and gentlemen, pride goes before destruction, God says, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Humble yourself. One of the things I like to do for my own life, and I didn't get this originally. I was taking a class called Bible Study Methods over 30 years ago from Dr. Howard Hendricks. And I still remember what he said uh, uh, after 30-some years after uh, taking this class. And he said to us in the class, so one of the great sins that some of you students are gonna, gonna make, commit, is that you're gonna dismiss the old people. He said, what you need to do is get with an older person, take them to lunch, sit them down, and pick their brain. He said because they live life longer. And they got something that they can teach you. And help you. As you walk with our God. And he said do not let old people take all that information that they have to the grave with them. You make sure you get some. Get some of those recipes. <laughs> Amen. We got too many young women in our days. All they want to do is microwave stuff. What will send every microwave to hell. <laughs> every microwave deserves to be in hell. <laughs> and we ain't going to try to save it once it go to hell. <laughs> when I was growing up, we had microwave. You had to do it the old-fashioned way. Took a while for it to cook. I baked the baked potato in the microwave. It took me 10 minutes. Ain't that so? Um, a baked potato, and I just put it in the microwave, put it on 10 minutes, and it was ready. Okay. 
You think, boy, that's great. Well, yeah, but she ain't telling you all the radiation in that potato either. <laughs> Amen. Send every microwave to hell. Every microwave need to go to hell. Let's go back to the regular stove. It take time to cook where it simmers a little bit. Amen. I know I got off on the subject, but I just had to say that. We need to have a plaque. Every microwave, go to hell. Send it to hell. I know we can't do it. We don't got used to it now. Amen. Now on the microwave, cell phones too. $700 for a phone. Blessed are those who are humble. Notice, and blessed are those who have a ferocious appetite to do the right thing, to learn the right thing and do the right thing. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be what? Satisfied. Satisfied. Notice that's a passive voice. And, 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 and Jesus deliberately left out the object. Who is the one that's going to satisfy you? He didn't tell you. Because it's implied in the text. The implication is, blessed are, hung, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And the question is, by whom? By God. You see, people in New Testament times couldn't go get something to eat when they got hungry. They couldn't do that. They can, they can go. Most of them didn't eat meat. Okay. Food was not readily available for those people. And those who thirst, water was scarce. That's why they had to dig holes in the ground and, and plaster it with plaster. Uh, it was called a cistern where they trap rainwater. Okay. Now, what do we do today? We get hungry, we go to the refrigerator. Nothing in the refrigerator, we go to Kroger, we go to Publix, whatever grocery store you shop at. Or we don't want to cook it, we go to McDonald's, we go to Burger King, we go to, you know, any place we, that's open, we can go and get a, get a burger. I mean, it can be 1 o'clock in the morning, you can go drive through and get you a burger. And some fries. They could do that in the first century. Likewise, we want some water, we get thirsty, we can go to the faucet. Turn the door off and the water comes out. They couldn't do that in the first century. Water was scarce. But notice, Jesus said, how blessed are those who hunger and thirst to do the right thing. They want to learn God's word so they can live God's word in doing the right thing. Man, they, they shall be satisfied. They shall be filled to the full with the potency of life, the enjoyment of life. And then, the truly blessed person are those who uphold God's moral standards. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is looking at the miserable condition of a person with compassion and meeting that need if you can meet it. See, God's mercy is that way too. God saw our miserable condition. Yeah. That we were helpless. We could not save ourselves. And, 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 and if he did not intervene, we live a life in a Christless hell. So God saw our miserable condition and sent his son to meet what we couldn't meet. Right. The fix what was broken and he met it and he extended mercy so ladies and gentlemen he said notice blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy you're not merciful you're not going to receive what is from God mercy really is withholding that which you do deserve when it comes to God it's called withholding what you do deserve grace is giving you what you don't deserve you see ladies and gentlemen is what Dr. Clint Sinclair Ferguson said about mercy. He said, mercy is getting down on your hands and knees and doing what you can to restore the dignity to someone whose life has been broken by sin. That's what mercy is. 
Someone else said uh, that we behave the most like God when we show mercy to those in need. Are you merciful? What about pure in heart? Notice what it says. Blessed are the pure. Where? In heart. See? Don't miss that. In heart. For they shall see God. Now what does he say to pure in heart? For they shall see God. Because those who don't want to be pure in heart don't want to see God. The pure in heart are those whose hearts are pure before God. They're sincere. They're genuine. Their motives are pure. And their heart is not divided. Let me read your statement in Psalm 24. A very interesting statement in Psalms 24 and verse 3. This was a psalm where the Jews were marching up to Zion uh, to the temple. I mean, the tabernacle, the Psalm of David. The temple wasn't built then. David says, as as you're marching up, the priest will, will ask a question and the people will respond. So the priest will ask, as you're marching up the hill of Zion, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place or that's in his holy presence? And the people will respond, he who has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood nor has sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing uh, from the Lord. Notice, pure hands. Right actions. Clean heart, right motives. So the pure in heart. Those who are whose hearts are right before God. Whose heart has not a person who's not allowed the world to dirty up their heart. You know, Jesus had some of the most stinging statements. To religious people. He had a lot of compassion on those. The whores. The prostitutes. But those folk that felt they was all right. <laughs> Jesus didn't play. This is what he said about the Pharisees. And the scribes. Matthew 23. Verse 25. What are you scribes and Pharisees? Hypocrites. For you clean the outside of the cup and all of the dish, but inside is full of robbery and self-indulgence. What are you? Verse 28. Even so you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you're full of hypocrite, hypocrisy and lawlessness. What Jesus is saying is that a person can be Clean on the outside and dirty on the inside. Brothers and sisters, let me say this to you. Whatever you do, don't let people dirty your heart up because they can dirty your heart. That's why Solomon says to his son, son, guard your heart. Guard your heart for out of it flows the issues of life. That's Proverbs chapter 4, I believe it's verse 23. In other words, don't let folk dirty your heart. Listen, church folks can dirty your heart up too. Don't think that just folk in the club can dirty up your heart, but folk in the church can dirty your heart as well. Don't let them do it. Don't let them do it. Keep your heart pure before God. Keep your motives pure before God. Be sincere. Don't be a hypocrite. Hypocrite is a Greek word for actor. Somebody asked Larry Hagman who played G.R. Ewing. So Larry, you played your Ewing so well. How are you able to, to, to not play him at home? He said, because I realize I'm playing J.R. Ewing. I'm not J.R. Ewing. <laughs> then he said, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who promote peace, harmony. Oh, we need more peacemakers. For they shall be called, notice, they shall be called the sons of God. <clears throat> notice he's not saying they are the sons of God. He said they shall be called. What does that mean? 
when people are hellraisers, can I use that term on the internet? And claim the name of Christ. <laughs> people don't call them children of God. <laughs> They said they ain't got nothing but the devil in them. Because peacemakers live in such a way. They live in harmony with God. They live in harmony with each other. Where there is division, they seek to bring harmony. They want to put relationships back together again that has been broken. They shall be called the sons of God. As Dr. Bruce Hurst said, that the peacemakers... Uh, those who seek to preserve peace where it is and to restore it where it is not. Then lastly, the truly blessed person is one who really, willingly remains loyal to Christ in the midst of adversity. Verse 9, verse, verse 10. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Now watch this now. Look at what Jesus' statement said. It's very important that you look at what the word said. He said, blessed are those who have been persecuted for righteousness. Why is that important? Because there are some Christians who claim they got fired because they love Jesus. No, you got fired because you had a bad attitude. <laughs> That's why you got fired. Blessed are those who are persecuted for standing up for what is right. And ladies and gentlemen, we live in a culture nowadays. Christians, listen, listen to me very carefully. The day is coming. Listen. The day is coming. The day is coming. Very, very, very soon. Well, you're going to have to make a decision. You no longer can hide behind church membership. The world outside, they ain't buying it no more. They're not buying it anymore. And you got to take a stand. You got to declare who you are. Because they're going to force you to declare who you are. Are you a Christian? Are you standing up? For what's right. Are you standing up for Jesus Christ. In the midst of a wicked and perverse. And evil generation. The day is coming. But you're going to have to make a decision. And declare who you are. And Jesus said the world's going to hate you. Like I hated me. See I don't believe a boy can be a girl. I don't believe a girl can be a boy. They tell us, in reference to global warming, believe the science, but they don't want to believe the science about a boy being a boy and a girl being a girl. And so people get fired because they ain't woke. What did you wake up to? I understand you're woke, but what did you wake up to? Christians, we need to take a stand in this world. And people ain't going to like it when you stand up for God's things, and God's truth in this world. And then he said, notice, blessed are those who insult you and persecute you and say all things kind of evil things against you falsely on the count of my say. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, folk going to lie on you. But guess what Jesus said? Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. The word be exceedingly glad is the word agliao. It's used in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse, verse 8. Agliao. Leap for joy. Rejoice and leap for joy. When they say all manner of evil against you. Or they did it to the prophets before. Because great is your reward. Where? In heaven. Yes, folks going to laugh at you. Dr. Ray Pritchard said, this is the blessing no one wants. People will slander you. They'll talk about you. 
and they will. They talked about Jesus. They'll talk about you. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. <laughs> this hit home to me as I was again thinking uh, about how to apply this particular passage. And it took me back to several years ago. There's a theme park in Atlanta called the Six Flags. And one year our church went to Six Flags and uh, my wife and I, we didn't decide we, decided we weren't going to drive. We were just going to ride the bus with everybody else. And we did. Went up to Six Flags. Stayed there all day. I mean, it was hot. Boy, was it hot. <laughs> and we had our T-shirts on and short pants and tennis shoes and socks or whatever, you know. And our hats, you know, for the, for the, for the heat of the sun. And we got ready to go. One of my dick and his wife said, listen, uh, I, we drove. Won't you ride with us? I said, okay. I'll ride, we'll ride with y'all back to Macon. Okay, great. So we got in the car with them. I said, hey, man, do me a favor. What's that? Let's go by the Fox Theater and, 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 and kind of see what's coming, coming attractions in Atlanta. So we, it's okay. We, we, by the Fox Theater, and we parked. We got out, parked, parked and got out. And we was right there under the porch at the Fox Theater where they have all the coming attractions, you know, like the movies. Coming soon, coming soon, coming soon. And so I was, you know, we were just walking around, you know, uh, you know, hmm. short pants, tennis shoes, and, you know, everything. And uh, I noticed people were coming in front of the Fox in limousines. They got out with tuxedos on and gowns on and, you know, and uh, we just standing there. Watch your folk go in, you know, hey, we figure something really big going on inside. So I'm standing there looking at, reading some common attractions. And this lady was standing there in her gown, she had on a gold gown with a gold purse. I mean, she had diamonds everywhere. I knew this woman had some money. <laughs> now, remember now, I just left Six Flags. Me and my wife and my deacon and his wife. And she was just walking around, and she was a little, little antsy. She was a little antsy. And she came up to me. She said, sir, can I talk to you a minute? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, uh, listen, uh, inside there's a show called Ain't Nothing But the Blues. Okay? And uh, my guest has not shown up. I got four free tickets. Would y'all like them? I said, yes, ma'am. Now, everybody else in there in tuxedos. <laughs> And gowns. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I patted my hair just a little bit. You know how you do. <laughs> I knew I couldn't change clothes. So I went inside. And I had to usher the ticket. I said, okay, well, you know, it's probably in the back. We'll we slip in and not be noticed. Would y'all not know? The place was packed to the rafter. I didn't see nothing but tuxedos and gown. And here I am with my wife and my deacon and his wife. We had just left the theme park in short pants and tennis shoes. And guess where our seats was? On the front row. <laughs> and I can almost hear people saying, what in the world? <laughs> Here come the clampets. <laughs> Got a front row seat. You know what? That didn't bother me. Because, see, I've never, I've been to the Fox Theater before. I couldn't afford a front row seat. And this front row seat was free to me. And guess what? I enjoyed myself with my tennis shoes and short pants on. And when, I, when it was over, I watched all them tuxedos. And all those gowns walk out the door. And I was just as proud as my short pants. And I got it. We got it in our car. Went on. What I'm trying to tell you is this. God, that woman had blessed us with those free tickets. And I was happy. And I didn't care who thought about me. Because when the usher kept walking with his flashlight, who was already late, show had already started, <laughs> he walking with his flashlight. I said, hey, man, uh, where the seats at? He just keep walking. Where the seats at? 
I'm thinking, I know that I'm looking at these folk looking at me like, are we going to get robbed in this place? And sat us down right there on the front row. See, ladies and gentlemen, rejoice when people laugh at you. Yeah, we looked at the Clampets that day. But even G.A. Clampett left the hills of Tennessee and went to Beverly Hills. And the Fox Theater that day was Beverly Hills for me. And I rejoice. And you can rejoice too because God has blessed you beyond your wildest dreams. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, when you are persecuted and you are slandered, rejoice! And let me give you this bit of information that I heard from a pastor on television several weeks ago. Bishop Bronner out of Atlanta was preaching and it really spoke to me concerning this issue here. He was telling his congregation, stop worrying about people who have decided that they don't want to understand you. And what that translated to me was stop worrying about people who don't like you and don't want to like you. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad because they did it to the prophets. You're in good company and they'll do it to you. People will lie on you. And sometimes you might have to live with the lie the rest of your life on this earth. But one of these old days, God's going to set it right, ladies and gentlemen. Because you're truly blessed when you're right with God. Thank you so much for watching our broadcast today. Sorry to be so long. But I thank you for listening. Thank all of those who have been giving online. If you'd like to share with us financially online, you can go to lethealbaptistchurch.org or lethealbaptistchurch.org and give online. Thank you for those who come by the church and mail you in your funds to the church to keep us going while this uh, pandemic has been going on. And tune in again next Sunday for another uh, powerful word from one of my associates. He'll be here preaching for us. I hope you'll tune in and listen to him. He's a great preacher. And so uh, we'll listen to him next Sunday. And we thank you again. God bless you and may have a smile on you. Bye-bye.